The signal to attack appeared at midnight on April 3, 1948. 89 bonfires lit atop extinct volcano craters served as the signal to begin operations against the occupying forces. Within the next two hours, simultaneous attacks were launched against right-wing paramilitary groups and police stations. Over a dozen former Japanese colonial collaborators and policemen were killed, as Korean independence fighters on Jeju Island struck a desperate blow at the American-backed regime. Despite their organization and their desire to free their homeland, the effort would end in disaster, as the U.S. inflicted untold suffering on the people of Jeju. The most powerful military force on Earth had turned its attention to an island so poor that wooden tools were still used because metal was so rare. The U.S. would use their doomed uprising as a demonstration of what would happen to anyone who stood in the way of its hegemonic global vision in the aftermath of World War II. Immediately after the defeat of Japan in 1945, the United States quickly set about working to ensure that it would be the unquestioned master of East Asia, setting up proxies and client states that could aid it in containing communism. Before American intervention in the former Japanese colonies, leftist governments were a real possibility in the region, as many of the leading national resistance figures to the fascist Japanese and their local collaborators had been communist guerrillas, and Washington was desperate to prevent the Soviet Union from gaining favor in these strategically important locations. While Americans were told that their sacrifices in the war against Japan had made Asia safe for democracy, Washington always ensured that this transition occurred with significant caveats. Elections could proceed if, and only if, they produced outcomes that contributed towards the containment of communism. If not, results were discarded and military regimes took the place of civilian governments. If locals persisted in pushing for freedom, the populations faced reprisals, and events on the idyllic Korean island of Jeju soon demonstrated the links that the Americans would go to to make sure that this was understood. The Americans believed that there was no price too great for local populations to pay, so long as it ensured communism never gained a foothold in any of the territories that had recently fallen under American influence. After one year of bloodshed on the island, U.S.-backed forces withdrew in 1949, having killed an estimated 30,000 people to eliminate a militant communist cell whose strength was never greater than 3,000 individuals. The lead-up to our story begins in 1945, when the people of Jeju welcomed the Americans to their island, treating them as liberators from the hated Japanese imperial forces. Jeju had been a hotbed of resistance to Japanese colonialism, culminating in ill-fated rebellions in 1901 and 1933. Over 100 miles off the Korean coast, the island was too remote to ever fall completely under the sway of Korea's Joseon dynasty, and Jeju boasted a unique matrilineal local culture and dialect that was distinct from the rest of Korea. And with these cultural, linguistic, and geographic distinctions came a strong desire for local autonomy. The overwhelmingly rural island has a long tradition of self-governing villages, in which women-led divers associations had played lead roles in organizing local communities for centuries. Though the traditional administrative culture of Jeju was more anarchist than communist, if one was forced to apply modern labels, the Americans were immediately suspicious of Jeju and its people. Their emphasis on communal living and an aversion to foreign domination earned Jeju the nickname of Red Island, and it was immediately claimed that local leaders were working to advance the goals of Moscow and Pyongyang. In reality, the people of Jeju placed a greater emphasis on autonomy and the preservation of their local culture than on any political ideology, and were just as suspicious of common turn agents as they were of the American-backed South Korean provisional government. The only real ideology of Jeju, if it could even be described as such, was the local saying, no thieves, no gates, no beggars. The rural culture was dominated by small villages governed by consensus, with female elders taking the lead role. But after decades of Japanese rule, Jeju was yearning for freedom. Not surprisingly, 
living as a hyper-exploited class under a series of right-wing dictatorships, had only increased their desire to return to the anarchist strains of the island's local culture, and an influx of students returning home from education abroad heightened the appeal of communism. This desire for local control and direct democracy can best be seen in the way that labor groups rush to fill the void left by the fascist Japanese colonial regime's retreat. Japan had invested heavily in industrializing the island, and immediately after the emperor's surrender, local enterprises were seized by workers who instituted a system of worker self-management. On September 23, 1945, five days before the arrival of the first American troops, a people's committee formed and soon elected a local governor. For nearly three years, the People's Committee governed Jeju peacefully, with the people of Jeju optimistic that the Americans would soon depart and reunification with the North would occur in short order. In contrast to the rest of South Korea, where the U.S. exercised a more heavy hand in intervening in local affairs, Jeju experienced years of peace and plenty. The People's Committees were grassroots organizations created on both sides of the 38th parallel as Koreans prepared for self-rule for the first time in decades. The People's Committee had broad popular support from Koreans across the political spectrum. Its leadership was composed of senior members of the Korean government in exile and those who had led the resistance against Japanese occupation. It was recognized by most foreign observers as the legitimate transition organization. But the U.S. military government in Korea declared itself the only legitimate power south of the 38th parallel and did not recognize the People's Committee. Instead of dealing with local representatives, the U.S. forcibly dissolved the committee so that it could place puppets in leadership positions. Despite its leftist-sounding name, the People's Committee included a number of high-profile conservatives. Even Syngman Rhee, the man that Washington would install as its puppet over South Korea, had been given the leadership position of chairman. But the fact that the group was dedicated to reclaiming Korean nationalism after 35 years under the Japanese meant that it had a revolutionary and anti-colonial outlook that was unacceptable in Washington. Given these facts, and the Korean people's desire for radical change, it should be no surprise that left-wing nationalists quickly came to positions of prominence and independence activist Lee Woon Hyung was named prime minister. The majority of its members were at home on the political left, not out of loyalty to Moscow, but because the fight for popular sovereignty resonated with so many people after decades under the heel of a barbaric colonial regime. It is also important to remember that it was the conservatives in Korea who had collaborated with the Japanese, while leftists like Kim Il-sung and other nationalists led the fight against them. Still, the political ideology of the People's Committee was irrelevant as the U.S. had no authority to disband it, and in so doing, cut off all political debate that was not amenable to Washington. Keep in mind that this occurred in a country that was ostensibly an ally who had just been liberated. Perhaps more significantly, by breaking up the People's Committee in the southern half of the peninsula, the U.S. struck a serious blow at unification efforts, because the committees continued to exist in the North. So who would the U.S. use to govern Korea? Not surprisingly, the U.S. turned to former Japanese collaborators to administer the southern half of the peninsula. Though there were plenty of conservatives within the People's Committee itself, it was stocked with nationalists, and the USA was looking to fill the army and civil service with those it knew would follow American dictates. Who better than those who had already shown a willingness to collaborate with a foreign power? This practice greatly antagonized Koreans, and stirred resentment against the U.S. To make matters worse, the U.S. declined to prosecute officers who were known to have engaged in torture and murder on behalf of the Japanese colonial administration. American forces doubtly knew that they would require the skill sets of these hardened killers to enforce the new status quo. However, even with people's committees being disbanded across the South, the Jeju People's Committee remained intact. The island benefited from its remoteness, the lack of a strong pro-Japanese faction, as well as strong support for local autonomy. This tradition of direct control was even seen in the island's economy, with 80% of farmers being independent landholders, in contrast to the national average of 40%. From the start, 
The Jeju People's Committee invested heavily in education and helped to establish schools on the island that worked to undo decades of lapsed education under Japanese colonialism. The People's Committee in Jeju demonstrated leadership, and while the U.S. military government ruled the country, the People's Committee had a more direct influence on the lives of the people. On November 9, 1945, when the American military government first arrived in Jeju, its initial assessment was that the People's Committee was, quote, the only party on the island, and to all extents and purposes, the only government. Even as late as October 1947, U.S. Occupation Commander Governor General John Reed Hodge told a group of visiting congressional representatives that Jeju was, quote, a truly communal area that is peacefully controlled by the People's Committee, without much common turn influence. But while the U.S. tolerated the presence of the Jeju People's Committee, it moved quickly to curtail the economic systems available on the island. Just as had occurred throughout the southern half of the Korean Peninsula, U.S. military authorities arrived and dislodged those who asserted local control over the industrial facilities. The Koreans asserting ownership of those local means of production had a claim that they felt was irrefutable. Had it not been their resources that had been stolen to build Jeju's industrial base? Were they not the ones pressed into forced labor by the colonial regime to build the factories that they now sought to control themselves? But their pleas fell on deaf ears, and control passed to the Americans at the barrel of a gun. By late 1946, the Korean Workers' Party was the preeminent bloc in the Jeju People's Committee, and the local orientation towards consensus meant that other factions were content to follow its leadership. Military and political committees were organized on the county, town, and village levels in a strictly hierarchical relationship to each other. Mass organizations on Jeju, under the direction of the Workers' Party, were also established, including a women's group, a farmers' cooperative, and a number of guilds and unions. However, the United States could not abide any authentic left-wing movements, even those such as the Jeju People's Committee, which it admitted was not influenced by the Comintern. Especially not in Jeju, an island with a strategic position between China, Japan, and Korea. A 1946 report compared it to Gibraltar in the Mediterranean, and Rhee later promised to permit the United States to build an enormous base there. This exacerbated tensions on an island that was already stretched to the breaking point. Immediately after the Japanese surrender, Jeju faced dire economic conditions, and a potential famine loomed on the horizon. Resources were already spread thin by the return of 60,000 Jeju citizens who had been forcibly relocated to Japan and forced to work in menial conditions. In its infinite wisdom, the U.S. military government did not allow people returning from Japan to bring back the money they had earned there, and their meager savings were confiscated. During the summer of 1946, Jeju suffered a cholera outbreak, and a drought resulted in chronic food shortages. But as all of this unfolded, the U.S. government indicated time and time again that maintaining the high living standards of corrupt officers who had worked for the Japanese was their top priority, even as they continued to exploit the people of Jeju. So in 1946, the U.S. government of Korea designated Jeju as a separate province, allowing the U.S. occupation commander General Hodge to assume direct control of the island. He saw to it that local law enforcement was stacked with right-wingers, even importing Japanese collaborators from the mainland when a lack of ideologically suitable local police could be found. The powder keg erupted when local demonstrations to commemorate Korean Independence Day on March 1, 1947, ran afoul of U.S. authorities. Despite the occupation, over 50,000 peaceful protesters gathered to celebrate independence from Japan. While outwardly a demonstration against Japanese colonialism, the irony was not lost on American forces, which interpreted the protests as a call for expulsion of foreign armies, Korean unification, and full autonomy. Despite being entirely peaceful, American troops stationed on the island soon ordered the non-islander Korean police to open fire, killing six demonstrators and leaving many more wounded. Several dozen protesters were arrested and held without charge, and days later, when a crowd gathered to demand their release, the police again opened fire on the peaceful demonstrators, and five more people lay dead. These events eroded any remaining public support for the American occupation, and the people of Jeju engaged in a general strike, 
with schools, offices, businesses, and even some police and soldiers joining. In addition to demanding the immediate release of everyone who had been arrested and compensation for their injuries, the strike demanded that the U.S. fire all Japanese collaborators from positions of authority, and for the soldiers who had fired on the crowd to face legal consequences. Furthermore, strikers demanded that the U.S.-Soviet Joint Commission, which was overseeing reunification, talks be reinstated. This was unacceptable to Washington, as it had long ago come to the conclusion that communists would win a sizable place in government, if not outright control, were any free elections held across the entire peninsula. By March 10th, it was clear that the strikes were gaining momentum, and that U.S. forces were at risk of completely alienating the entire population. Instead of heeding the reasonable demands of the Jeju labor leaders, the U.S. Governor General contacted the mainland and had other detachments of right-wing police sent to the island. In addition, over 500 labor organizers were arrested and tortured, while 66 native policemen who had refused to participate in the reprisals were dismissed. In protest, the right-leaning governor of the island, Park kyung hun submitted his resignation. The statement he issued proclaimed that, quote, independence is not complete even after liberation, end quote, adding that all 300,000 Jeju people are expressing condolences to the people killed in this tragic incident. He also expressed the people's support for, quote, our unified independence in the future. Park's successor, Yu Hei Jin was chosen based on his far-right predilections and willingness to use force to reassert control. Yu was a mainlander with barely concealed disdain for the people of Jeju. He was described as ruthless and dictatorial in his dealing with opposition political parties. Yu welcomed the infamous far-right death squad known as the Northwest Youth League to the island, using them as his personal muscle to break the back of the protest movement. The Northwest Youth League was already notorious for their exploits in the southern half of Korea, breaking up strikes and murdering leftist organizers with impunity. The Northwest Youth League was made up primarily of a group of landowners who fled North Korea after Kim Il-sung instituted modest land reform and cracked down on former Japanese collaborators. Viciously anti-communist in their outlook, the Northwest Youth League was hostile to any left-wing ideologies and saw little wrong in killing civilians in Jeju or elsewhere in Korea. The Northwest Youth League were promised land in exchange for their services in breaking the back of popular resistance in Jeju. Washington and Seoul both turned a blind eye to the actions of the Northwest Youth League as the group went from village to village, raping and murdering. The Americans gave the Northwest Youth League free reign on the island, not in spite of what they did, but because they knew exactly what they did. Washington wanted the plausible deniability offered by the use of proxy forces. The Northwest Youth League were quick to embrace torture for activists and leaders that had been arrested, with estimates of those imprisoned at this stage numbering roughly 2,500. At least three labor activists died from torture, and this was only discovered when their badly deformed bodies were pulled from a river. With the American occupation quickly losing legitimacy, the American army did the only thing it knew how to do. Rather than accede to the demands of the local population, or recognize that after decades of repression by the Japanese, the people of Jeju were not willing to exchange one foreign overlord for another, the U.S. doubled down on its aggression towards local activists. Despite the fact that all protests to this point had been entirely peaceful and lawful, the overriding fear of left-wing organizations gaining any popular legitimacy on Jeju spurred the Americans to accelerate repression on a massive scale. While the police responsible for torture and murder continued to terrorize the island under the explicit protection of the American authorities, the Americans put 328 Koreans on trial in sham military courts, denying them even the most basic due process protections. In a display of just how little regard the Americans had for Korean sovereignty, the occupation authorities even used an American judge to oversee proceedings that convicted 158 Koreans on charges such as organizing unlawful meetings, violating American military laws, and planning strikes. But solidarity among the people of Jeju remained strong, and strike support was so overwhelming that even 75% of the Korean employees of the military government participated. More than 95% of all public officials and workers joined the strike, 
including 41,211 people from 166 public offices and civic organizations. Participation was so widespread that police sent from the mainland were needed to operate the power plant. By March 20th, the entire police force in Moslupo had joined the strikers. At the same time in Daegu, on the mainland, thousands of students were also on strike. In early 1947, while the U.S. military government collected 69% of its stated rice quota in all of southern Korea, it collected only 1% in Jeju, where grain requisitions were five times higher. Though the strike soon dissipated, the brewing conflict began to heat up again in the run-up to elections in the U.S.-administered southern half of Korea. The South Korean Workers' Party was officially banned by the U.S. military government, but still enjoyed strong support throughout the peninsula, particularly on Jeju. At the time of the 1948 election, the United States estimated that 60,000 people, or roughly 20% of the population of Jeju, were members of the South Korean Workers' Party, and that all in all, about 80,000 islanders could be considered sympathetic to the party and its goals. The militant wing of this party, the Jeju People's Liberation Army, only had about 400 members, and even fewer guns. However, some 4,000 locally organized self-defense forces supported them, but they were mostly armed with hoes, swords, spears, shovels, and even rakes. Koreans from across the political spectrum were against the upcoming 1948 elections because they knew that a divided election would only further the administrative divisions. The conservative leader Kim Gu joined the South Korean Workers' Party in calling for a boycott, but the South Korean Workers' Party went a step further and called for a nationwide strike on February 7, 1948. This call to action resonated widely, and resistance was most vocal on Jeju, where protests included running battles with police. On March 1, 1948, police arrested 2,500 young people protesting the coming partition election, and again, many youth were tortured. At least one body was subsequently pulled from a river. Unauthorized rice taxation in 1948 was five times the 1947 level, something the impoverished people of Jeju could not afford. As a cycle of repression and resistance widened, the South Korean Workers' Party made preparations to end the reign of terror by seizing control of the island. After decades of foreign occupation, the indomitable people of Jeju had decided to rise yet again and revolt. But as the guerrillas made plans to regain control of their homeland, they never could have anticipated the horrors that the occupiers were willing to unleash to keep them in line. As the most powerful military on earth waged war on the people, the island, and life itself on Jeju, the inhabitants of this idyllic island were given a foretaste of the destruction that their country would be forced to endure in the years to come. Oh.